Hi, I'm Mark Parsimian. In this video, we'll be discussing functions. This material is from section 7.1 of the book, and the corresponding homework is this fairly large collection of exercises. We'll be talking about the definition of function, examples of functions, the idea of function equality, and the concept of images of sets and pre-images of sets. We'll be using a bunch of stuff from uh, previous uh, chapters of the book. Way back in chapter one, uh, you were introduced to the idea of ordered pairs and ordered n-tuples. So you're all familiar, familiar with the idea of ordered pairs of numbers, like in the xy plane. But that can be generalized. You can have ordered triples. For instance, the, the coordinates of a point in three-dimensional space uh, are uh, an ordered pair of three numbers, three real numbers. And you can have ordered uh, collections of numbers that are other sizes as well. So instead of saying an ordered pair or an ordered triple, you could just say ordered n-tuple. The key thing is the order matters, and it's a bunch of numbers in parentheses separated by commas. You were also introduced in chapter one to the Cartesian product. Cartesian product is the set of all ordered n-tuples. So for instance, that symbol a1 cross a2 is the set of all ordered pairs, where the element on the left of the ordered pair is in set a1, and the element in the right on the ordered pair is an element of set a2. Now, Exponent notation is often used for Cartesian products. So for instance, r cross r cross r is often denoted r3. The coordinate plane is often denoted r2. In general, if you have n copies of any set in, the, in a Cartesian product, then that can be denoted by this symbol, a superscript n. And in particular, in one of your homework problems, you are um, introduced to this idea you have a set that's the set containing the numbers 0 and 1. And you can have a bunch of those, a, cross, uh, a Cartesian product of a bunch of those things. This is, this is not a fraction. This just means the, the Cartesian product of n copies of that set. That would be denoted by writing that set with the superscript n. Now in chapter 1, uh, you are also introduced to the idea of relations and functions. So a relation from A to B is just simply a subset of the Cartesian product, A comma B. And that means that it's going to be a collection of ordered pairs, where the thing on the left is in set A and the thing on the right is in set B. And to say that uh, X is related to Y is denoted by this symbol, X, R, Y. And it just means that that ordered pair is an element of the of the set that's the relation the set that's a subset of the cartesian product now that's all very abstract you you have been dealing with relations since grade school though for instance the the less than symbol denotes a relation uh, to say five is less than seven could be pronounced five is related to seven and that would mean that the ordered pair five comma seven is uh, an ordered pair that's an element of the set that is the less than relation set. Now, you are also introduced to the idea of a function from a set A to a set B, and that de is denoted this way, f colon A arrow B, and it is a relation with domain A and codomain B. What that means is, well, it's a particular kind of relation that has this property. For every element in set A, there's an element Y in B, such that um, X is related to Y. So we'd say that Y equals F parentheses X. So that was the kind of abstract presentation of relations and functions from section, uh, from chapter one. In the current chapter, we're going to study functions in more detail. And so we're going to again have the definition of functions as relations from chapter one. Uh, that function definition is here. But the, the definition gets fleshed out a little bit more in chapter seven. We have this terminology. We write f parentheses x. It's spoken f of x, or the output of f for the input x, or the value of f at x. All of that means 
that element on the right that corresponds to the element x on the left. What's called the range of the function is the collection of all the y values, such that y is f of x for some x in the domain. Now there's a new term, f parentheses x is also called the image of x under f. Now the range of f can also be thought of as the image of the whole set, the whole domain. So the set of all outputs that come from some input in the, in the domain, that's called the image of the domain, and that's the range of the function. There's also an idea of the pre-image of, of a y value, or what's called the inverse image of y. We'll come to this more later in the video. So we're going to start with a bunch of examples of functions. The Perhaps the simplest function is what's called the identity function on a set. It's denoted this way, capital I subscript X, or little id subscript X. That X is capital. When that, um, when that symbol is written this way, it's spoken this way the identity function on capital X. So when you write that or say that, that thing, capital X, is, is a set. Now, what does it mean? Well, this simple I subscript capital X is a function. Its domain is the set capital X. Its codomain is the set capital X. And it's defined to work this way. I capital X of X is x. So for instance, uh, question a um, in this example, i subscript r parentheses 7. Well that's a function whose domain is the set of real numbers and whose codomain is the set of real numbers. So you could think of f in terms of a picture as doing this. Takes as input a real number and spits out as output a real number. Well, the way that function is defined, whatever you feed in as input, it spits out as output. So i subscript r parentheses 7 is just going to be 7. If you feed in x equals 7, you get out x equals 7. Now, what about this horrible thing? Well, this just means take that identity function and feed something into it. Well, it doesn't matter how ugly the thing is that you feed in. What comes out is just whatever you fed in. So that's the idea of the identity function. Now in section 5.1 of chapter 5, we discuss sequences. Now in the video for homework 5.1, I introduced a very simple definition of sequence as a list of numbers. It was this definition. But there's actually a more sophisticated um, definition of, of sequence. And the book presents this definition, which is uh, more in the spirit of what we'll be doing today. A sequence is a function whose domain is either all the integers between two given integers or all the integers greater than or equal to a given integer. This definition allows for lists of things that are not just numbers. So for instance, the list of months of the year could be thought of as a sequence whose domain is the set 1 to 12. So for instance, on that, in that sequence, the seventh entry is, is the, uh, the month of July. Now in our examples from uh, the video for homework 5.1, we saw that the form of an explicit formula of, uh, for a sequence depends on the starting index. Um, so you have a choice for that. So for instance, in that video, we discussed this sequence and we came up with an explicit formula for a sequence using a starting index of zero. And then we found an explicit formula for the sequence using a starting index of one. Well, in the terminology of functions, we could say that the formula for the function for a sequence depends on the choice of the domain. So the questions that we saw in that earlier video could be rephrased this way. Uh, so here's a sequence. 
uh, find a function with domain the set of non-negative integers. That means um, integers that are greater than or equal to zero. Find uh, a function that describes the sequence. And then question B could be find a function with domain the set of positive integers that describes the sequence. That would be finding a formula with a starting index of 1. So you've encountered before this idea of having to pay attention to the starting index when you come up with a formula for a sequence. Well, in the current homework, you have a homework problem where you're given a sequence and you have to come up with a function with a particular domain that describes that sequence. So you have to pay attention to, to the domain that you're given and make sure that you choose the right formula that corresponds to that domain and that, and that uh, gives that sequence. Now, um, most or all of your previous experience with functions has been with functions whose domains are sets of numbers. But there's nothing in the definition of function that requires that the domain be a set of numbers. Uh, often it's useful to have functions that have their input taken from a set rather than a number. And in those situations, it's, it's, um, it's helpful to have um, uh, some way of describing the types of sets that you're going to be considering. So you want to have some terminology that narrows down the category of sets that are being considered. One useful term for that is, the, is the, that of the power set of a given set. So if you're given a set A, then what's called the power set of A is denoted with this symbol, um, script P parentheses A. And what it is is the set of all subsets of the set A. Now in in the book, their script P looks like that. In my typesetting program, my script P looks like that. But this symbol denotes the power set of A. It denotes the collection or the set of all possible subsets of set A. So for example, consider this function. This is similar to one of your uh, homework problems. Set A is this collection of names. I think there are, well, we'll just see that a bunch of names. And I'm going to define a function f this way. I'm going to write f colon p parentheses a arrow z. So this tells us that the domain of the function is the power set. So in other words, what we're going to feed in to this function as input is a set, that is, some subset of A, some collection of, of people's names. And uh, the codomain, the outputs, are going to be integers. Now, how does this function work? Well, it works this way. If you feed that function a set S, you simply count the number of things that are in the set S. If s has three elements, then the function spits out an output that's the number 1. If set s does not have three elements, then the function output is defined to just be the number 0. So for instance, let's compute this function value. The input is this set of names. Now notice there are four names in that set. Well, that means that our output is going to be the number 0. Now, how about this next one? Feed in as input this set. This set has three names. Well, since our set has three elements, the output is defined to be the number 1. What if I feed in the whole set S? Well, I'm sorry. This should be um, F parentheses A. Well, the set A is there. How many names are in there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Well, there are 13 names in that list, in that set. That's not 3. 
Now, finally, what about this last question? F parentheses phi or phi. Well, remember, that's the empty set. has no elements. Well, since it does not have three elements, the output is defined to be the number 0. So that's an example of a function where the input is not a number. And even if a function does have an input that involves just numbers, it can be complicated by having the numbers be part of more complicated structures. So for instance, functions can, can have input or output consisting of ordered tuples. So for instance, let's let j10 be this set. That's a set that has 10 elements, uh, the digits 0 through 9. And we're going to define a function called f this way. Its domain is going to be this thing. Now that's the Cartesian product of j10 cross j10 cross j10. That means ordered triples of things that are in this set. So that's going to be something like this. That's a collection of three items from the set j10 that are separated by commas. And then what's the codomain? What are the outputs? The outputs are going to live here. They're going to be ordered pairs of elements that are in this set. So that's a mouthful. Let's just do an example. So here we're supposed to compute f parentheses uh, parentheses inside parentheses 4 comma 7 comma 2. So inside of this parentheses is the input. The input is this ordered triple. And the output is going to be an ordered pair. So what's on the left of that output? The left element of that output is going to be a plus b plus c mod 10. So that's going to be 4 plus 7 plus 2 mod 10. Now what's going to be on the right side of that pair? It's going to be that thing. So 4 times 7 times 2 mod 10. OK, well, let's simplify that. Uh, 4 plus 7 plus 2, that's um, 13 mod 10. And on the right side, uh, that green element is um, uh, 56 mod 10. So the output is this ordered pair, ordered pair of elements that are in J10. Let's go on. Um, some common mathematical functions have descriptions that are not simple formulas. So for instance, the definition of logarithms and logarithmic functions is kind of confusing. Uh, it's defined this way to say that log base b of x equals y means that b to the y equals x. So uh, I'm going to let you uh, do this homework problem without any guidance from me, because it's the sort of thing that you've had before in, in high school classes uh, dealing with exponents and logarithms. You have uh, this homework problem that involves logarithm functions and their corresponding exponential functions. You have to find values for the logarithms and explain uh, where they come from in terms of the exponential functions that correspond. I'm going to go on. Projections. Earlier in, in the video, we had a, a, a started our discussion of functions with the identity function on a set, which is a very simple function, the function that just spits out as output whatever you feed in as input. Well, even though that's a very simple function, it's often very important. Well, there's another very simple but very useful class of functions that comes up when dealing with Cartesian products of sets. And the functions are called projections. And they have to do with basically leaving out some of the coordinates in a Cartesian product to produce a new Cartesian product with fewer co coordinates. We're only going to discuss a simple example of a projection here. It's going to be called the projection onto the kth coordinate. And it's going to be denoted by p subscript k. But in a lot of books and papers, they use this symbol, pi subscript k. It's spoken, the projection onto the kth coordinate. Now, you use this symbol when there's some Cartesian product in play. And what this function does is it takes as input 
an ordered M tuple. It's a bunch of um, numbers side by side, or could be other uh, things besides numbers. But anyway, a bunch of things side by side, separated by commas in parentheses. And it picks out just the kth one. So notice, it takes in as, as input an ordered M tuple, and it spits out a single element from the set A subscript K, capital A subscript K. So for example, let's let X, capital X, be the set of positive integers. Let's let capital Y be this set A, B, C, D, E. And let's let capital Z be the set uh, Roman numeral I, Roman numeral 2I, and Roman numeral 3I. Then P subscript 2 would be this function. It would take ordered triples um, and spit out just the middle coordinate. So P subscript 2 acting on X, Y, Z just spits out Y. So P subscript 2 acting on 13 comma D comma I would just pick out the letter D, whatever is in that middle position it picks out. And notice again that the the codomain, the outputs set, is, uh, is the set Y. Now this generalizes, of course, uh, the, the projection onto the third coordinate, P subscript 3, well, would just pick out that I. So its codomain is that set, Z. Let's go on. Now, um, there are lots of examples of functions involving strings and bit strings. We talked earlier uh, about ordered n tuples. They were introduced in chapter one. And there's a slight variation of this called a string. It's um, basically like a, an n tuple, but written without parentheses and commas. And the elements of, of, an, of a string are called the characters of the string. And the null string is defined to be the string that has no characters. Well, in the homework for this section, you'll have a problem that's about functions whose domain and codomain are sets of bit strings. Uh, bit strings are strings that are made up of zeros and ones. And that exercise ref uh, references an example that's presented in the section. So the whole point of that exercise is for you to carefully read the example and understand it. So uh, they purposefully did not um, uh, explain too much in their presentation of this exercise. They want you to read that example and understand it. So I'm not going to go over uh, functions involving bit strings here. I'll let you read that example in section 7.1 and, uh, and work on that homework problem. Now, Boolean functions are introduced on page 432. What's called an n-place Boolean function is a function whose domain is the set of all ordered n-tuples. So that's where you get the word n-place. So its um, input is uh, the set of all ordered n-tuples of zeros and ones, and whose codomain, that is its, its outputs, live in the set 0, 1. You could describe that domain as uh, the Cartesian product of n copies of the set 0, 1. So that would be denoted this way that I mentioned earlier in the video. You take the set whose elements are 0 and 1, and you raise it, you put a superscript n, and that means 0, 1 cross 0, 1 cross 0, 1 n copies. I wrote that earlier in the video as well. So that's the kind of thing that will be fed in as input to, um, to a Boolean function. Now, the book's discussion of this is excellent, and there's no need for me to discuss it in this video. But I will point out this, that in the book's discussion, you'll read that there are multiple ways of presenting a particular Boolean function. They can be presented by an actual formula, or an arrow diagram, or by a table of values. So one of your homework exercises is about finding the output values for a, a three-place Boolean function, but also about giving an 
alternate presentation of the function involving a table. And I think, well, I forget if you have to uh, come up with an arrow diagram as well. Anyway, uh, I don't need to discuss that here because, again, the book's discussion of this topic is excellent. I want to talk a bit, though, about this idea of when are two functions equal. Now, that doesn't sound like it would be confusing, but in, in practice, a lot of students don't really understand what it means. So, for instance, are these two functions equal? Many students will say that these two functions are equal. They'll, they'll say that you can, you know, you can just cancel these x minus 2s and f of x is the same as g of x. But they're not actually equal. Why aren't they equal? What's the criterion for function equality? Well, the key is to remember that a function is a relation. And that means that a function is a subset of a Cartesian product that satisfies a certain requirement. So that is a function is a subset of the Cartesian product that has this additional property. For every a in the domain, there is exactly one b in the codomain that makes a pair a comma b. There's exactly one of those pairs in the set that is the the set that's the function. Remember, a function is a is a relation, and a relation is a subset of a Cartesian product. So uh, you commonly think of functions as machines that take in input and spit out output, but the, the more abstract mathematical definition of a function is it's a set. It's a set of these ordered pairs of this sort. So the function is a set of ordered pairs, and a function g is also a set of ordered pairs. And the ordered pairs for the function f are ordered pairs that look like this. Let's go on. So we already know what it means to say that two sets are equal. They contain exactly the same elements. So to say that two functions are equal has to mean that they contain exactly the same ordered pairs. But that means that they'll have to have the same domain and the same codomain. And for every element of the domain, the, the outputs have to match. Well, you see that these two functions, f of x and g of x, are not equal because they don't have the same domain. The domain of g is this set, whereas the domain of f is this set. All real numbers except x equals 2. In symbols, we could write this. There is the domain of, this, of the function f. The domain of g is that. So those two functions don't have the same domain. They're not the same function. End of story. But you could also be sort of, you know, really drive the point home and, and say, look, um, g of 2 is 2 plus 3, and that's 5. Whereas f of 2 would be, let's see, 2 plus 3 times 2 minus 2 over 2 minus 2. So that's 5 times 0 over 0. So that's 0 over 0. That does not exist. So those functions really are not the same. One of them has a y value when x is 2. It's a y value of 5. The other function is not even defined when x equals 2. The y value does not exist. Now you have a homework problem, this number, number 14, involving two functions whose formulas involve the floor and ceiling functions. They were introduced in, in section 4.6, which we didn't cover in this course. The floor function is defined this way. You've got this symbol that looks like that. And what that means is the unique integer n that makes this inequality true. x has to be greater than or equal to n and less than n plus 1. Whereas the ceiling of x is written that way, and it's the unique integer that satisfies this inequality. In this inequality, the less than or equal to goes on the right. Uh, x is greater than n minus 1 and less than or equal to n. Uh, so for example, the floor of pi is the number 3. The ceiling of pi is the number 4. On the other hand, if your number is 
an integer, then its floor and its ceiling are the same, and they're just the integer. Now, you have a homework problem that involves the question of whether two given functions that involve floor and ceiling are equal. I won't d discuss a similar example here. I want you to puzzle through that. Now, uh, I want to talk about images and pre-images. The book has this definition of the image of a set and the inverse image of a set. So the image of a set is the set of outputs that result when you use that set as the inputs. So if you have F parentheses A, that means that you are going to use all the X's in A as inputs, and you're going to see what the outputs are, and the, the, the collection of all outputs is called the image of A. On the other hand, what's called the inverse image of a set is this idea. You write this, F superscript minus 1 parentheses C, and what that means is um, find all the inputs that will cause the output to be in that set. A common term for inverse image is pre-image. Now this is all, I've been speaking very quickly, this is a uh, this is con sort of confusing notation, but I think it'll be clearer if I just do an example. But I want to point out that there is some subtlety here, and the notation can be misleading. So for example, here's a function, f of x equals x squared. Find the image of negative 5, comma, 4, that set. So let's uh, jump back up and look again at the definition of that. The image of a set is the set of all outputs that you get from using the elements of that set as the input. So for our set, the images the image is this set containing two elements, 25 and 16. So again, the symbol for that is F parentheses, the whole set. And it's the set containing those outputs. Question B, find the image of this set. Now that's a whole interval on the number line. Now for that it might be useful to draw a picture of the set. So there's our interval, negative 5, comma, 4, without the endpoints. Now, we can actually just show this whole thing being fed into f. f parentheses, that whole thing. So what are the outputs that come out when you square those numbers? Well, realize that when you square any number, you get a number that's greater than or equal to 0. Notice that 0 is in this set. So 0 is going to be in the output. Let's draw a picture of the output. You see that 0 is in the set, so 0 is going to be in the output of that set. And um, let's see, the number uh, 1 is in the set, so 1 is going to be in the output, and so on, all the way up until, well, if you were to square the number negative 5, you'd get the number 25 as the result. But tw the number negative 5 is not in the set. So 25 is the endpoint of the output. The set of outputs is this red set. So the set of outputs is the half open interval that contains the number 0 and does not contain the number 5. And the symbol for that is, again, it's F parentheses, and then the whole set description is inside. So you could also say F parentheses, and then inside those parentheses, put this description of the input set. Question C says, find the inverse image of 9. Now, what does that mean? The inverse image of a set is the set of all x's that will cause the elements of that set to come out as the y values. So when I ask for the inverse image of 9, I'm asking for this. The symbol is this f superscript negative 1, and then inside of that is the number 9. And this is going to be the set 
containing all the x values that will cause 9 to be the y value. And that's going to be negative 3 and 3. So notice the inverse image of 9 is a set containing two elements. Uh, the inverse image of 0, well, that's going to be the set containing all the x's that will cause 0 to come out as the y value. Question E, what is the inverse function? Well, that's a trick question to draw your attention to the fact that even though we use this symbol and we talk about the inverse image, this function does not have an inverse function because this function is not one-to-one. -one. Now, we haven't discussed one-to-one -one yet in this class, but I think you have seen it before in, in high school. This function fails the horizontal line test. That horizontal line touches the graph at two places, so the function fails the horizontal line test. So that's why we know that f of x equals x squared does not have an inverse function. Again, even though we write symbols like this, and we talk about the inverse image, the, there is not an inverse function. Uh, question f, what is the preimage of negative 5? Now, preimage, remember, remember that's a word that I introduced that means the same thing as, as inverse image. Inverse image is the same thing as preimage. So the inverse image, inverse image or preimage of negative 5 means the set of all x's that will cause a negative 5 to come out as the y value. Well, realize that when you take an x value and you square it, you always get a y value that's greater than or equal to 0. The y values on this graph are all greater than or equal to 0. There is no x value that will cause y to be negative 5. So the preimage is, is the empty set, and that's denoted this way. The preimage of negative 5 is the empty set because no x values have x squared equals negative 5. Now, question G. Find the preimage of negative 5, comma 4. Now, that's a whole interval. Let's draw that interval so we can get a, a look at it. Oh, we've already got that interval drawn. It's up here. So let's copy that. Put it down here. Now, we're supposed to find the preimage of that this time. Earlier, we were interested in finding the image of that. So we're going to put that in parentheses and put f superscript negative 1. Now, here we're asking for the x values that will cause y values to come out that are in that green set. Well, um, of course, there are no x values that will ever cause any of these numbers to come out as a y value, but there are x values that will cause these numbers to come out. And so the preimage, or the inverse image, is this set. The number 0 is in the preimage because 0 squared is 0, and that is in the green set. The number 2 is not in the set, because 2 squared would be 4, and 4 is not in that set. But all the numbers between 0 and 2 are in the set. They are in the preimage. So the preimage is de described in interval notation this way. That's the end of that example. Now, um, so to, re to reiterate some of the stuff that we talked about, this symbol, f superscript negative 1, in general does not denote a function in the ordinary sense. It does not take as input a, a number and produce as output a number. So for instance, we found that the preimage of 9 was a set. And so two numbers are in that set. So the output of, of that symbol 
was not a single number. And for um, for the number x equals negative 5, the preimage was the empty set. So as I said, this function f of x equals x squared does not have an inverse function in the ordinary sense. It can't. But sometimes this symbol does denote a function in the ordinary sense. So for instance, um, the function g of x equals x cubed does have an inverse function. It's this. g inverse of x is x to the 1 3rd power. What's interesting is to realize that for any function, though, this symbol does sort of describe a function of a different kind. The domain of this symbol is the set of all subsets. That is, if you look at our questions, we asked uh, what was the inverse image of 0? What was the inverse image of this whole interval? Um, we could ask what was the inverse image of any set we wanted. Any subset of the real, not, of the real line is game for being put in these parentheses. So in that sense, uh, this, inverse in, this inverse image symbol can be put next to any subset. And what are the kinds of results that come out? Well, we took the inverse image of 0, and we got a set containing one element. We took the inverse image of 9, we got a set containing two elements. We took the inverse image of negative 5, and we got the empty set. We took the inverse image of this whole interval, and we got that whole interval. So every time you find an inverse image, it turns out that the result is some kind of set of real numbers. So the codomain of this symbol would be the set of all subsets. So in other words, this symbol takes a set of real numbers and spits out a set of real numbers. So it is sort of a function, but not the kind of function that you are comfortable with in the sense that for g of x equals x cubed, it has an inverse function that's an ordinary function that takes as input real numbers and spits out as output real numbers. Let's go on. Um, this example is sort of more abstract. It's similar to 7.2 number 42, one of your homework problems. So we're supposed to prove or disprove this. Uh, the statement is, for all functions from some set x to some other set y, and for all sets a and b that are subsets of x, f parentheses a intersection f parentheses b is an, a subset of f parentheses a intersection b. Well, this is actually a false statement. Let me show you why. Let's let f, capital F, be the squaring function. So uh, this is a function that has a domain that's real numbers and codomain that's real numbers. And let's let set a be this set, the set whose element is uh, only only one element is 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 the the number negative two, and let's let b be this set. All right. Now notice uh, what is f parentheses capital A. Well, that's going to be the set of all outputs that result from numbers that are in that set. So it's going to be four. And what is f parentheses b? Oh well, it's also four. So you see that f parentheses a intersection f parentheses b is the set whose element is 4. But let's look at this set. What is a intersection b? a intersection b is the empty set. So f of a intersection b is the empty set. That's the set of outputs that come out when you don't feed anything into the function. Well, that's the empty set. And notice that this set is not a subset of this set. So we have a counterexample that shows that this statement is false. But there's a part B to this question. Prove or disprove this statement. 
for all functions from some set x to some set y, and for all subsets of x, f of a union f of b is contained in f of a union b. This is actually true. Let me show you how you'd prove this. Now notice, this is a, a general statement. It's a universal statement. It's got a universal quantifier there and a universal quantifier there. So we're going to prove this using the method of generalizing from a generic particular element. So that's how this proof has to start. How does this proof have to end? Well, we have a universally quantified statement, and that's the predicate. So that predicate is going to have to show up as the very last statement of the proof. And then that will be the end of the proof. So we have no choice about this proof structure. We had to put all of the stuff describing the domain in this first step. We had to say that we had a generic particular element of that blue domain. And we have to end the proof with the, the statement that's that red predicate. Now, let's work backwards. How do we have to show this red statement? Well, that's a subset statement. It's de, it's, that's a defined term. So what we have to do is we have to say, suppose an element is in that set, we have to prove that it's also in that set. So the supposing that an element is in this set is going to have to go way back at the very beginning. And that, that x should actually be a y because it's in uh, these sets are sets in the output space, y. So an element of that space is going to be a, a, some element little y. And what we have to what we have to show is that y is an element of the right side as well. So we suppose that y is in the left side, and we have to show that therefore y is also in the right side. So we have no choice about that green pair of statements. Now, what, where do we go from here? Well, notice again, we have, uh, we have a defined term. We have a union here. So we have no choice but to follow this statement up with what that means. So we have this OR statement. That's the definition of union from statement two in the definition of union. Uh, now, where do we go from here? Well, we, we know that um, either this is true or this, that's true. So let's, let's do a proof by cases. So let's do case one. So we start by saying, suppose y is in f of a. Well, what does that mean? That's a defined term. So we have to follow that up with what it really means. So maybe I should call that, instead of x, let's call that a, little a. So y is f of a. And that's by 4 in the definition of image of a set. But notice, if a, if little a is in a, then little a is also in a union b. That's just by definition of union. The union is all, all elements that are in a or in b, so anything that's in a is qualified to be in the union. But that means that since a is in a union b and y is f of a, that means that y is in f of a union b. That's by 5, 6, and the definition of image of a set. So we see that y is in f of a union b in this case. Now we're going to need some more room here. I'm going to move this stuff down to the next page. So let's finish this case a little bit more clearly. What we've said in statement um, 7 is that y is in f of a union b in this case. 
Now let's uh, do case two. Case two is when that is true. Well, it's going to unfold just like case one. So it's going to start by saying, suppose y is in f of b. And then we have to say what that really means. It means there exists a little b in set capital B such that y equals f of, of little b, that should say. And that's by 8 in the definition of image of a set. All right, well, we'll do the same thing that we did in case one. Since little b is in capital B, we can also say that little b is in the union of capital A and capital B. So that tells us that y is in f of capital A union B. OK, so in case 1, we found that y is in f of a union b. In case 2, we found that y is in f of a union b. So now we can have conclusion of our cases. This will be our step 11. I'm sorry, our step 12. So this is by 3 and 7 and 11, and the mef method of proof by division into cases. So there you can see the whole proof. We had no choice about this first statement. We had to introduce a generic particular element of that domain. We had no choice about the very last statement of the proof. It had to be the statement that is the predicate. We had uh, no choice about some other stuff as well. This final statement of the proof has a defined term in it, subset. The only way to prove that that statement is true is to have done this. Said, suppose that some element y is in the left side and prove that, therefore, y is in the right side. So we had no choice about that, that uh, pair of green statements either. And then we had no choice about this black statement. We had to use this, we had to unpack the definition of a union by writing this black statement. So what we had to do ourselves that was clever was this middle part of the proof, knowing that we, that we should approach it by proof by cases. But the big clue was we had this great big or statement right there in statement three. When you have an or statement, you, you uh, have the option of using a proof by cases. So that's the end of the, this example. This example is uh, similar to, to your homework problem, 7.4, number 42. So in this second, in part B, we proved this statement because it was true. So that's the end of this example, and that's the end of the video. Thank you.